In this video, I'm going to discuss the molecular orbital theory and how it can take us beyond simple descriptions of Lewis structures that I talked about in the last video. So one of the important questions that organic chemists have to ask when thinking about structure is where are the electrons really in atoms and molecules? Given the Lewis structures that we developed last time, you might imagine that electrons are fairly constrained. They have to occupy particular regions of space that are dictated by their Lewis structures. To an extent this is true, but what chemists in the early 1900s realized is that it's impossible to pinpoint the exact position of an electron within a molecule. Instead, we can only work with probability distributions of where the electron might reside. Based on this insight, the molecular orbital theory was developed. Molecular orbital theory starts with the atomic orbitals, which you can see on this slide here. There are four valence atomic orbitals that we'll be concerned with, the 2s, 2px, 2py, and 2pz. You can think of these as containers in which the electron is highly likely to reside. So in a sense, we can treat them like electron pair domains in their own right. The red and blue regions that you see are different phases of the orbital. A lot of students make the mistake of considering these to be related to charge. They're not. They're more related to the sign of the orbital. This is going to become important when we start adding and subtracting orbitals to make molecular orbitals from the atomic orbitals that you see here. Associated with each of these four atomic orbitals is an orbital energy. Because the three p orbitals look exactly the same and differ only in their position, those three have the same energy and they're all slightly higher than the 2s because of this region in the center of each orbital where there is no electron density. We call this region a node, and nodes have the effect of raising the energy of orbitals. We'll see this come back again when we discuss molecular orbitals of larger molecules. We can combine the atomic orbitals, as I mentioned, to create molecular orbitals. There are three kinds of what we call overlap of atomic orbitals that can take place. When two of the same phase come together, as for instance, when two 2s orbitals come together, the two similar phases reinforce one another, and we get what's called constructive overlap. Between the two nuclei that are coming together, we end up with a region of high electron density, forming what we would imagine would be a chemical bond in which the electrons that were brought by each of these orbitals are shared. Energetically, we would imagine the two orbitals, each with one electron in them, combining to form an orbital that's more stable with two electrons in it. On the other hand, we can imagine destructive overlap, where if we bring in two orbitals of opposite phase, now when they combine in the region between the nuclei, there will be a place where the addition is zero. At that point, we'll have a node. Just as it did for the 2p orbital energies versus the 2s, a node in this case will destabilize the resulting molecular orbital relative to the starting atomic orbitals. And so each atomic orbital bringing in one electron will lead to a destabilized molecular orbital, which we call anti-bonding. Anti-bonding because between the nuclei there is a node of no electron density and in fact the vast majority of the density is outside of what we would classically consider to be the chemical bond. Finally a third possibility is no net overlap. You often see this in examples where the two p orbitals are perpendicular to one another or a p orbital is interacting with an s orbital. Let's consider that latter case. Imagine we take an s orbital on one atom and imagine combining it with a p orbital on an adjacent atom. What's going to happen as we bring these two together? Well, on the one hand, the 1s will interact with the unshaded lobe of the p in a constructive fashion or a bonding fashion, but on the other side of the node, the unshaded 1s orbital will interact destructively with the shaded P lobe. What this leads to is equal parts constructive and destructive overlap. 
for no net overlap overall. What this looks like energetically is the two orbitals coming together for no net stabilization of the resulting molecular orbital. Because there's no incentive for the two orbitals to combine, we won't see these kinds of interactions, and in fact, these are called disallowed.